Welcome to Tell Your Story in Code, Learn Python Making a Game Script. My name is Jennifer Strombeck. I'm the Library Digital Assistant at the St. Joseph County Public Library. I'm by no means an expert on the subject, but I do have fun creating some of my own games in my spare time, and I'd like to share my hobby with you. So I hope that you can enjoy making some simple text-based games in your spare time as well. Let's get started. Text-based games, otherwise known as interactive fiction or visual novels, are games that heavily rely on the story narrative to engage the player. Here's some footage from a game I'm working on right now. There are some visual and audio elements such as moving pictures and music and sound effect to help create an atmosphere, but really it's just a dressed up choose your own adventure. The story is mostly linear, but the player can make choices for the protagonist that shape the story's outcome. In this particular example, I keep track of the player's choices and assign them a certain type of point. At the end, I evaluate what kind of points they've earned and assign them an ending dependent on these factors. In programming terms, I keep track of the player's choices using variables and then I evaluate these variables using conditionals to determine what they've earned. Before we jump right into coding, let's talk a little bit about what coding is. Why? Why can't we just tell computers what to do and have them do it for us? This is due to the physical limitations of a computer being a machine. Because modern computers can perform so many tasks, a hundred billion tasks all at once, sometimes we can forget that they're actually still a machine. So I wanted to go back to the Jacquard loom so that we can break down what coding is and what the machine is actually doing when it's reading code. Jacquard's loom was an ingenious device that had a series of pins that would read punch cards. If there was a hole, the pin would go through. If there wasn't a hole, then it wouldn't go through. Using this system allowed the loom to create very complex and accurate patterns. So the very first programs were basically a series of holes or lack of holes. Yes, pull the needle through. No, don't pull the needle through. This is what we call a binary system. Have you heard the word binary before in relation to computers? When you're thinking of computer binary, you're probably imagining something like this, a series of practically indecipherable zeros and ones. The very first computers were used for counting, and much like the Jacquard's loom, they would count by having transistors that were on or off. These on and off states would be represented by a zero or a one. As you can imagine, writing code in binary was very tedious and very easy to make mistakes. Single transistors that could only represent zero or one are known as bits or binary digits. These bits were able to be arranged into groupings called bytes. Bytes allowed for many bits to be treated as a single unit, enabling the computer to understand far larger values than what could be represented by single bits by themselves. ASCII, or American Standard Code for Information Interchange, was developed so computers could display different characters and recognize characters that were inputted from people's keyboards. This means when you type a lowercase a, Somewhere in your computer is a tiny row of eight transistors with the pattern off, on, on, off, 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 on. At this point, you might be beginning to wonder how a bunch of little on-off states can add up to all the wonderfully complex things that your computer can do in an instant. In a nutshell, computers can do complex tasks largely thanks to Boolean expressions, or logic gates and Boolean algebra. It would be a lot to cover right now, and I highly recommend that you try Googling these terms for more detailed explanation. For what we're going to do today, think of on-off states also being interpreted as true or false. There are a lot of logical conclusions that you can reach with just true and false statements. For example, you most likely use Boolean operators every day when you try Googling for information. 
Let's say I want to find a book on travel and tourism because I plan on taking a trip and I want to be able to know all the hot spots. Using the Boolean operator AND will ensure that I will only get the research results that include both travel and tourism. In terms of true and false, that would mean that travel would have to be true and tourism would have to be true in order for both travel and tourism to be true. If a book was about travel but not about tourism, in other words, one true and one false, it would not meet my criteria of both statements being true and therefore should not show up in my search results. In other words, that book would be false. If I change my operator from AND to OR, suddenly my results have changed, allowing for search results that could include books about travel or tourism, or in Boolean terms would mean only one of the two statements would have to be true in order for the result to be true. Suddenly, false plus true equals true when the Boolean operator or gate is OR. So why Boolean values? Well, much like binary, it has to do with how computers work on a mechanical level. Remember we talked about transistors? These transistors turn on and off with a tiny current of electricity. The flow of these currents can be controlled by the Boolean gates. Now that we have a general understanding of how computer coding works, let's talk about Python. Python is an interpreted high-level language. That means that the computer actually needs to interpret the code back down to a binary level in order to execute the code that you write. It does this by using a compiler, otherwise referred to as an interpreter or a shell. Other important terms to know is what is an IDE? An IDE is an integrated development environment. You can think of it as a word program made for programming that highlights syntax and makes it easier to organize your code or debug any mistakes. In creating a program, you'll rarely do so from scratch. There's no need to reinvent the wheel if somebody already else has created a good program that will be similar to the one that you want to create. In making games, developers usually use a software development kit or SDK, otherwise known as a game engine, that has already optimized a bunch of code that many of these games share in common. You might have heard the terms algorithm and syntax in relation to coding. I would argue that the algorithm is the hardest part of coding and the syntax is easy once you understand the algorithm. Even though syntax can be very particular, you can easily find documentation of any coding language that will instruct you on the proper syntax. It's much harder to find instructions on which type of algorithm you should use in order to have the computer to perform whatever given function you want it to. Unlike syntax, it's rarely cut and dry as to one single solution. Therefore, when we get into actual coding, I don't want you to focus on the syntax. Rather, I want you to follow my thought process. We're going to be creating a simple game, so the algorithm will be pretty simple. So to answer, is coding hard? I would say it depends. And in our case, it's going to be pretty easy and should be a lot of fun. I'm going to be using a website called pythonanywhere.com. You can also download and install Python for free at python.org. Python Anywhere does require for you to sign up for a free account, so feel free to pause this video. Once your account is set up, you'll be greeted with the dashboard. The console is going to be where we execute our Python commands. I'm going to be using version 3.7. Give it a moment to load and then it's ready to take our script. I'm going to start by asking it to display the words hello world. To do this, I'm going to use the print command. Inside the parentheses will be the string of text that I want it to display. I can execute this command by hitting the return button. The program is executed on the next line, displaying the words hello world. The word print here is a special command word that Python understands, but the words inside the quotes have no intrinsic meaning. All it knows about the words hello world is that these are a bunch of characters that I want it to display. Now I'm going to use another special command word called type. Here I'm asking Python to evaluate what type of data. 
is inside the parentheses. It doesn't matter what I type inside the quotation marks. If it's in quotes, Python will treat it as a string. A string is just a sequence of characters, where order and capitalization is important. Still, we can do a lot of things with these strings, such as store them, modify them, use them as variables. We can use them to display information to the user and interact with them. These strings don't have to be letters. They could be numbers or any other odd character. Speaking of numbers, though, if you were to ask Python what type a number is when it's not within quotations, if we enter a number just within the parentheses, this is no longer a string. This is now an integer. It has mathematical value, and Python can add, subtract, multiply, and divide these numbers. If a number has a decimal point in it, it is now considered a float. We won't be using these for our project, but just know that Python treats these two different data types differently. The last type I'm going to mention here is called Boolean. Remember what I said about Boolean before? You can assign values of true and false. When creating an interactive fiction such as we are, it's very useful to control the flow of the story and make the reader's choices have impact. Be aware that it's case sensitive. And so if you spell true or false with a lowercase t or f, Python will not recognize it. I'm going to leave the console for a moment now to create a file so that I can write a longer script. I'm going to select open another file in order to create a new file, make the pathway my home under my account, and I'll name it myfirstprogram.py. Whatever you decide to name your file, be sure to end it with a .py file extension. Otherwise, Python won't know to run it. When you've created your file, you should see a blue Run button in the far right-hand corner. I'm going to start by making a developer note in the first line that will lay out what I plan my program to do. I'm going to put a hashtag in front of it so that Python knows that it's not expected to run this line as code. It's just a notation for me or other programmers who would want to know what my program is supposed to be doing. I'm planning on making a text adventure. I'm going to have it be about daily life. For interaction with the player, I'm going to have them make three choices, one for the morning, one for the afternoon, and one for the evening. If they make good choices, then they'll get a good ending. And if they make bad choices, then they will have a bad ending. I'm going to achieve this by assigning them points for making good decisions. So I'll be able to present the different options to the player just using the print command, but I need a way to record their input and assign them points depending on what decisions they make. Variables are like containers that can hold data, so I'm going to make a variable for both the morning, afternoon, and evening choices. Then I'll make a conditional that if they make the good choice, they'll be awarded with a healthy point. Healthy points will be a variable that I'll call health, and I'll assign a numeric value. This health variable will increase every time they make a good choice. Lastly, I'll have a final conditional that will evaluate how many healthy points they've earned. If they earn a total of three points, they'll get the good ending. And if it's less than three points, then they'll get the bad ending. I accidentally put here in my notes less than equal to three when it should be less than equal to two. I'll fix that later. In Python, when you want to evaluate an integer and see if it's greater than, less than, or equal to a set value, you need to use equal equal greater than equal or less than equal. If you were to only use one equal sign and say health equals three, then you are assigning the value of three rather than just checking to see if it equals three. Okay, I have my notes, so now I'm going to start my game by greeting the player. I'm going to use a print command. You wake up in the morning. It's the start of a brand new day. This will provide some context for the choices they're going to make. In this case, the first choice will be related to 
let's say breakfast. I'm going to start a new line and ask them the question, will you eat breakfast? Here's where they're going to make their first choice. I'm going to use the def or short for define function command to create a function. My function's name will be choice one and my first variable is going to be morning. Morning is going to equal the player's input. I'm going to put a prompt here, choose one of the following options to let them know what I'm looking for them to input. I'm going to ask them to choose A, B, or C. A, you eat a banana. B, you want chocolate. Or C, you skip breakfast. Inside the parentheses, I have quotes around my text. This is going to be a string. It's important to remember to close your string and close your parentheses. Next, I'm going to create an if conditional. If they choose morning option A, the banana, I'm going to give them the message, print, the banana is delicious and nutritious. This will only display to the player if they choose A. Or if morning equals B, or if in Python is written as E-L-I-L or elif. If morning equals b, then the player wants chocolate. We'll display a message, you eat your favorite candy bar, yum. This type of back and forth feedback will give the player the sense that their choices have meaning. Now let's make another elif for if they choose option c. If morning equals c, then they decide to skip breakfast, so I'm going to print the message, you decide to wait until lunch. This will be a good point to stop and try running my program to see if it works. Already I can see there is a little X on line 4 that there's going to be a problem, but let's go ahead and see. Oops, one last thing, I didn't actually tell Python to execute the function that I defined, I merely defined it. Let me go ahead and write a line to say that I wanted to execute that function choice one. As we predicted, our program crashed and wouldn't run because of the error that was flagged. Looking at it closely, I can't see anything wrong with the syntax. It's actually the line above it that's having a problem where I forgot to close the parentheses. Because I forgot to close the parentheses, Python basically smushed everything on line 4 at the end of line 3 and none of it could make any sense. Let's try saving and running the program again now that we fixed it. You wake up in the morning. It's the start of a brand new day. Will you eat breakfast? Choose one of the following options, A, B, C. But what if the player decides to put in the answer, banana? Hmm, no response. Didn't meet any of our conditions. I better make an option for what if the player puts in something other than A, B, or C. Else is going to cover anything else that the player could possibly input. Here I'm going to clarify that I want them to choose either A, B, or C, and I'll rerun my choice one function so they don't have to restart the whole game in order to pick A, B, or C like I'm asking them to. Now if I put in a capital A like the program is asking, then I get an answer. But what if I choose to put in a lowercase a? triggered my else conditional because Python doesn't recognize lowercase a as being the same as uppercase a. Here's why I can make things a little bit easier for the player and just tell Python to make whatever letter character the player inputs capitalized automatically. Say morning variable equals morning variable capitalized. After I've made my changes, I'll save and rerun my script and try putting in the lowercase option again. After running it and seeing that the problem of the lowercase letter has been fixed, I'm feeling pretty confident that my function is working as I'm intending it to. I'll go ahead and copy and paste this entire defined function, choice 1, and just change choice 1 to choice 2 and change my morning variable to afternoon variable and the string text inside. This will save me the work of having to write basically the entire thing all over when most of it is the same. Don't forget, after defining the new choice2 function, 
to go ahead and write a line of code, choice two, to tell Python to execute that function as well. As we did in the beginning, I'm going to add a few more strings of text in between choice one and choice two to give the player some context to what their choices are for. In a more serious project, this would be more fleshed out. After all, we want this to be an interactive story and not just a questionnaire. I'll go ahead and copy and paste my choice function again and alter it to be choice three evening variable. Remember to tell Python to execute my newly defined choice three function. And then I'll go ahead and save and test what I've gotten set up so far. Let's go ahead and run our program again. Let's see, what do we want to eat for breakfast? Les picks chocolate. We eat our favorite candy bar, the morning flies by quickly, and now what do we want to choose for our afternoon option? Let's go ahead and choose B. We're going to watch TV. We watch reruns, and then it's dark, and now we're on to our third choice, the evening choice. Here I'm going to choose computer games, and we get our response, and that's all we have so far in our script. This is all working out well so far. Let's look back at our statement at the beginning, though. We wanted to keep track of points that they earn for making good choices to lead to a good ending. Let's go ahead and add that in now. I'm going to go ahead and create that healthy points variable and assign it to the value of zero at the beginning of the game. Then, under the healthy option of banana, I'm going to go ahead and enact global health so that it keeps track of this variable throughout the entire program and say if they chose A, then they will get plus one to that health variable. I'll go ahead and add those same lines to choice two and choice three. Now that we've assigned our points, let's go ahead and create a new function to evaluate the total points at the end of the game. Let's say if health equals three, that means they've earned three points for making three healthy decisions. We'll reward the player with a congratulatory message. Let's tell the player, you feel really great about the decisions you've made today. Congratulations, well done. Let's consider what other possibilities could occur when a player runs this game. They could earn anywhere between zero to three points. Let's go ahead and come up with a message if they've earned less than the maximum amount of points, but they've still earned at least one point. Here I'm going to use a Boolean operator AND to say if they have have health points that are greater than or equal to one and they have health points that are less than or equal to two, meaning they have a value between one and two combined, then they'll get the mediocre ending. It's not bad, but it's not the best. Let's tell the player, you made some good and some questionable decisions today. Not bad, but maybe you could do better. I know I really didn't want to go over a lot of syntax in this particular exercise, but you'll notice that I had to use two sets of parentheses for both of those conditions. You may have also noticed that all the strings or displayed text in this game is highlighted in green. Key commands like def, print, if, elif, and are all highlighted in blue. Some lines of my code are indented, or what I call nesting. These lines of code are only run if the line of code that it's nested inside is executed. Lastly, I'll make an else statement. If their health is not greater or equal to 3, and if their health does not meet the greater or equal to 1 and less than and equal to 2, then they'll get the else result. In this case, I only have a total of three possible points, so I know the result would be left with zero. I'm going to print them a message, 
you feel a bit guilty for your poor decisions today. Maybe tomorrow you can do better. Now that I've defined my evaluate choices, I need to remember to execute it at the end of my code. Oops, I misspelled evaluate. Be careful because this IDE is only highlighting syntax. It doesn't know how to spell check for you. I'm going to finish my game with a universal message for anyone who's played it up to this point, thanking the player for their time and telling them that it's the end. Now it's time to save our file and try playing through it. We're not quite finished yet. It's very important to run your program several times to ensure that every possible outcome is working properly. First, let's try to shoot for all three points and see if we can get the healthy ending where we're congratulated for our choices. You feel really great about your decisions you made today. Congratulations, well done. Well, that works. Now let's go ahead and try to go for the mediocre ending where we choose at least one healthy option and at least one unhealthy option. Not bad, but maybe you could do better. Great, it looks like it's keeping track of our health points. Lastly, let's go ahead and try for the bad ending where we've made all poor choices today. We'll go ahead and answer all C's and now we've got the ending. Maybe tomorrow you can do better. It looks like our program has worked out. Thanks for watching and I hope that you can make your own story-based games in the near future. We are making a collaborative story game about life during the COVID-19 pandemic as a young person. The name of the game is Viral Life. Write your own morning, afternoon, and evening choices so that we can add them to the game. We'd love to have your contribution. Your syntax does not have to be perfect, and you can include as little or as many variables and functions as you want. Include your developer notation, and we can clean up anything you might be struggling with. Viral Life is a web-based game, so you don't have to install anything in order to play it. You can just play it from your browser. Visit our website at coffeedripstudios.itch.io forward slash viralife. Send us a text file or a .py file, or just copy and paste your story script and send it to studio304 at sjcpl.org. If you have any questions or you want to learn more, feel free to email us and attend our virtual Zoom meetups June 17th, 6 to 7 p.m. and July 1st, 6 to 7 p.m. We can discuss other development kits and free tools that are available for people who are starting out to develop their own games. Please join us. Well, thanks so much for watching. I really enjoy making games, and I think it's a super fun hobby. I hope that you can find it to be a great creative outlet as well. Take care.